When you like Ventura TV Appliance on Facebook, it's nice. But when you love the Samsung big screen we deliver, it's even better. Our website is cool, and it's a good place to start. But you really should touch the merchandise before you buy. Time for that upgrade to an HD 3D web-enabled Samsung TV. Get the best selection, price, and service in town without waiting. Come in to Ventura TV Appliance and touch the merchandise today. When you like Ventura TV Appliance on Facebook, it's nice. But when you love the Samsung big screen we deliver, it's even better. Our website is cool, and it's a good place to start. But you really should touch the merchandise before you buy. Time for that upgrade to an HD 3D web-enabled Samsung TV. Get the best selection, price, and service in town without waiting. Come in to Ventura TV Appliance and touch the merchandise today. Hi, I'm John Malos. Welcome to this live edition of Connect with Can Me. You like Ventura, Ventura TV Ventura Appliance TV. on Facebook? Today, today it's Ask an Expert Day here on the program. And, um, you know, you can call in and ask your questions at 436-ME-TV, option 11. We're going to cover a wide-ranging variety of topics, mainly about politics, including our question of the day. Back with our program in just a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to the program. We're live here on the showroom floor at Ventura TV, and you're watching us live on Comcast Channel 187 and 43.6, and of course now 13.1. And as a reminder, you can watch us uh, on the replay uh, today later on at uh, 2 o'clock on YouTube and at 8 o'clock tonight. That would be on Biz TV. Hey, I want to remind you, and there is uh, the replay at 2 and at 8 o'clock tonight. A reminder, you know, you've got to send these mailers in by February the 5th. You, I know you receive these in the mail. Everybody in Fresno, not Clovis, not Parlier, not Sanger, this is the water issue. Do you want your water rates going up? You should have received this card in the mail. We'll put some graphics up on the screen. you got to check that box right there and then sign the card if you don't want your water rates to go up. If you uh, do want them to go up, then don't mail them in. By the way, Mark Standriff, the communications director for the city of Fresno, there he is. If you have any questions, you can call him at 621 8000. There is also a recorded number that you can call 621 8618. You have until February the 5th, and so you've got to get these mailers in. There they are, right there. You should have received that in the mail. And then the card that you've got to sign. You've got to check the box. And, and remember, if you don't mail it in, that counts as a yes vote that you want your rates going up. So you have until February the 5th. They have to be inside the uh, city clerk's office by that date. All right, some good news to report about those uh, climbers at El Capitan. They finally made it to the top yesterday afternoon. It was hallelujah, and they reached the top of El Capitan. Tommy Caldwell and Kevin uh, Jorgensen, uh, they made it to the top yesterday. They received a tweet from the President of the United States tweeting out, hey, anything is possible. And so uh, they climbed to the top. Uh, they started, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. It took 19 days to climb. 3,000 feet. El Capitan stands, you know, if you double the size of the Empire State Building in terms of height, that's El Capitan right there. And so Jorgensen, 30 from Santa Rosa, Caldwell, 36 from Colorado. They were free climbing, meaning they used no type of special equipment or aid to get them to the, to the top. As predicted, they made it. They tore their hands apart, bleeding, skin coming off, but they made it. And so congratulations to those two reaching the top of El Capitan. Another quick reminder about the Warner's Theater this coming Saturday. They've got the Spinners series coming up. The Warner's completely redoing their sound system for that. That starts at around 7 or 7.30 on Saturday night. They will feature Queen Nation and also Space Oddity. 
All right, to our main focus in our program today, Ask an Expert Day, and it is to honor a man who served up in Sacramento for nearly three decades, and his name was Ken Matty. I want to put his picture up on the screen right now. You know the man. Uh, he served uh, here in the Central Valley for many years. The former state assemblyman and state senator was so well respected by his peers, they named an institute after him, the Kenneth L. Matty Institute, Department of Political Science at Fresno State. And why not? He graduated as a bulldog back in 1957 and spent most of his time at the state capitol in Sacramento creating and crafting bipartisan solutions um, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. He leaves a rich legacy of leadership in public services, passion for life and family, and public policy and politics. Carried on by the man who runs the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler, that man right there, the executive director. His job is preparing, implementing the budget, seeking grants, hosting the Maddie Report on both television and radio. Established back in 1999, the Maddie Institute is helping the next generation of people, problem solvers, and I, you know, maybe even politicians, I don't know, but not those type of people that maybe you see on Fox News or CNN yelling and screaming, screaming at each other. Instead, those, those who have thoughtful, insightful, political knowledge and thought. And it's to help educate the general public on political issues and to create discussion. Kepler is an 11 year veteran of this place. He's also a labor management arbitrator, a civil rights mediator, and he serves as judge pro tem with the Fresno County Court System on occasion. He earned his bachelor's in New York and has a master's and has a law degree from the University of Wisconsin. Yes, my friends, he is a badger. We can badger him today. Live in our studio is Mark Mark Kepler, the executive director of the Maddie Institute. Glad to have him along. We're going to talk about politics today. We'll talk about a wide ranging uh, sorts of uh, sort of topics. Uh, we're going to be all over the board today talking about uh, everything under the sun in terms of political and uh, political issues and politics uh, here in the state of California. The question of the day is, if you had the power, what law would you change in the state of California right now? Hey, remember, Barbara Boxer is not running. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the water issues and cap and trade and all sorts of other things. 436 Me TV Option 11 is the telephone number here. Wait for your phone calls. Mark Kepler's here. You are there. We're back in a moment. Spinner's Records 2015 Concert Series at the Waters Auditorium kicks off with Queen Nation and Space Oddity in a salute to Queen and David Bowie Saturday night, January 17th at 7.30. Tickets available at Spinner's Records, Olive and Lucerne, Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to 6. Online at SpinnersRecords.com. Or call in the Warner's Ticket Office at 559-264-2848. Queen Nation and Space Oddity salute Queen and David Bowie Saturday, January 17th at 7.30 at the Warner's Auditorium, Fulton and Tuolumne. A Spinner's Concert presentation. Dare. We introduce the first home freezer. The first pulsator agitator washer. And now we introduce the Frigidaire Orbit Clean Dishwasher, designed with a unique wash arm that gives you four times more water coverage for a consistently better clean. Frigidaire, over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. That was a long monologue. Jeez, it's 10 after 10. 436, Me TV, option 11. A lot to uh, cover uh, on this day. It's Ask an Expert Day. I'm ple uh, pleased to uh, welcome in Mark Kepler of the Maddie Institute. Good to have you along. Hey, you're a first time guest here. Yes, I am. I'm Thank glad, you. I'm Thanks glad. for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. And to have a man of your distinguished qualities, uh, we're honored that you're here. And so, uh, I said a lot of politics today. I mean, we're going to cover just about everything under the sun. Let's start with what happened a year ago in the Democratic uh, part of the Senate uh, up in Sacramento. Okay, <laughs> I want to put up a couple of pictures up. Leland Yee, let's start with him. What happened to this guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's probably the most interesting of, of, of the stories going up there. In, uh, in March, uh, he was arrested for uh, corruption and conspiracy to uh, traffic in weapons. Um, and the interesting thing about him is that God. he was a big gun control advocate. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, that, that trial is ongoing, um, but he has since termed out, so he's no longer in the Senate. 
but he was the third in a series of problems with uh, the senators up in uh, Sacramento. Yeah, so uh, what's the status now? So is it, is it in trial now? Or? It's in trial now, yeah. It is. It's going so through that process, depositions and, and whatnot. In uh, San Francisco? Or? Yes, it'll probably be in San Francisco. Wow, you got to wonder if he's going to get a fair jury, but uh, it, it is interesting. He was a gun, gun control advocate, and now he ends up... Uh, you know, uh, facing all these charges. What kind of charges are they? Do you know? Uh, well, basically, he uh, he was meeting with uh, undercover agents and uh, agreeing to collect weapons and shipping them overseas to various terrorist groups. It just it's it's a wonderful. Mess. It's an absolute wonderful. mess. All right, how about Rod Wright? Uh, another one that got in trouble. Uh, yeah, he, he lied about where he lived, which actually apparently is not that unusual for politicians. He got caught. Um, it's interesting when you talk to the politicians <laughs> up in Sacramento. He was actually fairly well liked. And it would have been a relatively minor censure um, in his situation. But the problem is that he was the first of a series of problems. And by the time Leland Yee's problem came up a few months later, the Senate pro tem, the leader of the Senate, said, we got to do something. And so all three of them got, got basically kicked out. Yeah, the um, other guy is Ron Calderon. We'll put his picture up on the screen as well. And so he got in trouble with what? Um, he was indicted uh, 24 counts uh, for bribery, another undercover sting operation. He was going to help with some uh, with a film commission and or run some legislation to help some folks uh, film some stuff in California and uh, taking bribes to do that. My goodness. So has the Democratic Party up in Sacramento, specifically the Senate, have they rebounded from this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think if you take a look at the election, uh, Democrats weren't hurt at all. Uh, yeah. the, the bottom line is they retained all of the uh, constitutional seats. Uh, governor won by a landslide. And though they did lose their supermajority, they did have two-thirds majority in both the Senate and the Assembly. They lost that. But they still have very heavy majorities in both houses. Um, and the reality is California is trending Democratic. Yeah. Hey, before I get into the other political news that we want to talk about on the day, I do want to put up another picture of Ken Maddy. We saw him in the monologue, and I do want you to talk a little bit about him. I went over it, but I, I kind of glossed over the fact sure. that this guy served for nearly 30 years. He was bipartisan. He created and, and masterfully, I, I would say masterfully, uh, created policy that was so bipartisan, everybody respected him, both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. uh, you knew Ken Maddy, didn't you? Uh, no, I actually never did. You I was, I was, him, huh? I was a low-level college professor just working towards so tenure. So you never had a chance to meet him. I never, I never met him. Um, I, what I, do you think of him from what well, you've read? Well, it's interesting. I'll tell you, I was, I had dinner with his son a couple of years ago, and I was in, in Sacramento, mm -hmm. and I told him that the most impressive thing I ever heard about your dad, Ken Maddy, was we were in an elevator. Uh, one time, I had a bunch of students. We have uh, legislative interns that work in the state capitol. Yep. And we had them uh, meeting various legislators who were in the elevator, and there happened to be an elevator operator. They still had elevator operators in the state capitol. Uh, must have been a union job, but uh, they, they were still there. I don't think they're there anymore. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we get on the elevator, and the elevator operator says, you know, whoa, who are you? Where are you from? I said, oh, I'm Mark Hepler. I'm from Fresno at the Ken Maddy Institute. As soon as I said the name Ken Maddy, she starts talking about how wonderful he was. This is now, over a decade after he had passed. Wow. And I told, his, I told his son, you know, regardless of all the legislation he carried, how significant he was as a legislator, the most impressive thing I've ever heard about Ken Maddy was an uh, elevator operator going on and on about how, how, what a wonderful guy he was. And it showed you this kind of person he was. He was a yeah. major political figure, but he treated everybody the same. Yeah. And because of that, he was very well liked uh, and respected. Caller, go ahead. You're on the air. A real quick question. Uh, since uh, Barbara Bo um, Boxer is not going to uh, uh, go for another term, who do you think as a Democrat would would fit right? I mean, to take over, uh, Republicans are going to put a lot of money in, in, into this, mm -hmm. but who do you think can take uh, do the as uh, a good job as Barbara Boxer uh, uh, did? It depends on your right definition question. definition of good. If you're a Democrat, and by the way, there Democrats are not monolithic. Um, you know, there are you know more <laughs> conservative Democrats like a Jim Costa, and there more yeah. there are more liberal Democrats. So that's the first thing. Your definition of what is what constitutes good. You know, right now we've got Kamala Harris has already declared. Uh, former LA Mayor uh, Antonio Villagrosa has indicated he's probably likely to run. Uh, Tom Steyer, a, a billionaire, is 
is also talking about uh, a possible run. That is Kamala Harris right. right there. She is the attorney general of uh, California right now, and she's right. the she's the front runner as far as being a Democrat. She's right? the only runner at this she's point. She's the only runner at this point. <laughs> but a lot of people do uh, do think that she's a rising star in the Democratic Party. Uh, but it's interesting. I mean, she is going to have one group that will support her. You're going to have uh, the mayor in Los Angeles, like I said, Antonio Villagrosa. If he runs, he'll have a different constituency, uh, more of the Latino Hispanic constituency. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, Democrats are going to have uh, field quite a few candidates. Villagrosa versus uh, Harris. Who has a better name recognition in California? That's a really say? that's a very tough question. I mean, Kamala Harris is the AG and and one uh, statewide. However, uh, Mayor Villagrosa was the mayor of Los Angeles, which was where... Speaker of the House, too, right? He was, he was speaker. He wasn't really known. Some, yes, he yeah. was Speaker of the Assembly. But not but well-known. Not well-known. But as mayor of L.A., where all the votes are... More well-known. <laughs> more well-known. <laughs> it's probably a bigger job. Isn't that weird? <laughs> that works? All right. Caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Good morning. Since the 1960s and probably before, there's been a lot of talk, and finally we got it to a vote in the past to divide this great state of California up so we could get Los Angeles and San Francisco away from controlling the rest of us. Does it look <laughs> like that, that might be a possibility coming down the road, or is this just a pipe dream that's going to carry on for another 50 years? Okay. Um, I would say pipe dream, and I wouldn't say 50 years. I would say never. Um, really? And, and the reason for it will never happen. You mean, you mean California will never be cut in half? Never happen. Oh. Um, because what would happen is it would require a change in the Constitution, which would mean all, it would dilute the votes of all the smaller states like Rhode Island, et cetera. And so you need a, uh, was it two thirds or three quarters votes to change uh, that part of the Constitution. It'll never happen. The smaller states will never give up uh, their control in the Senate where they get two senators in a state like Rhode Island or a low population state like Montana. Never going to happen. It's a total pipe dream, waste of time. Move on. Okay. All right. Talking <laughs> so, well, I'm, I know a lot of people, I know, kind of the idealists among us, hey, that would be a really interesting idea, but political reality says it will never happen. Yeah, they get all pumped up and, right. okay, let's cut yeah. this state in half. And, and one of the problems is, you know, frankly, I hate to be so harsh about that, but one of the problems is that it diverts people's attention to, to the real problems and the real solutions that could occur to solving those problems. Well, so instead unemployment, of, immigration. So instead of focusing on the problems and how we solve them, we go off in this kind of quixotic, you know, thing of we're going to change, the, you know, divide the state into six things. It's, it's a total waste of time. Right. And education is a problem, too. I, I forgot to throw that in there. Mark Kepler from the Maddie Institute is here. First time guest. Glad to have him along. Glad to have you along as our viewers. 436, Me TV Option 11. As mentioned, we'll cover everything under the sun. Well, at least we'll try here in the state of California. 436, Me TV Option 11. Back in just a moment. Everything under the fog maybe today. Yeah. Spinner's Records 2015 Concert Series at the Waters Auditorium kicks off with Queen Nation and Space Oddity in a salute to Queen and David Bowie Saturday night, January 17th at 7.30. Tickets available at Spinner's Records, Hollywood Lucerne, Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to 6. Online at spinnersrecords.com. Or phone the Warner's Ticket Office at 559-264-2848. Queen Nation and Space Oddity salute Queen and David Bowie Saturday, January 17th at 7.30 at the Warner's Auditorium, Fulton and Tuolumne, a Spinner's Concert presentation. Frigidaire. We introduce the first home freezer. The first pulsator agitator washer. And now we introduce the Frigidaire Orbit Clean Dishwasher, designed with a unique wash arm that gives you four times more water coverage for a consistently better clean. Frigidaire, over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. Back here on the program, 436, Me TV Option 11. Mark Kepler is here from the Maddie Institute out at Fresno State. Caller, are you there? Nope, not there. Okay, be patient. Just call back in, turn down the sound. Uh, put up the question of the day, and that is, let's take a look at it, and we'll read it together, my friends. If you had the power, what law would you change here in the state of California? That's our question of the day. And it's, uh, man, if you just had the power of the pen, Mark, what would you do? Oh, well, we're, first of all, we're a nonpartisan institute. We don't take positions on issues. Yeah. Um, but I remember a few years ago, there was a lot of talk about CEQA reform. Um, because while the law, like many laws, well intended, um, it sometimes is misused by folks. And so, um, you know, they sue to stop, you know, Save Mart might sue Vons because they don't want to see another, you know, food store in an area. Unions might use it in negotiations uh, with their employer. It, it's being used inappropriately, and so probably uh, 
some modification or change in the CEQA uh, is something that some people have talked about. Uh, the other thing you might, uh, some people have talked about is actually having laws sunset, that after a period of time we should go back and revisit laws and to see whether they're still necessary. I mean, last year... That's a good idea. Last year they passed 900, and, well, passed and signed by the governor, 931 laws. Now, some of them are very significant, like wow. driver's licenses for undocumented yeah. immigrants. Others were things like having pets at restaurants. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a wide-ranging group, and, and maybe sometimes we should go back and kind of clean, clean out the books and see what's still relevant, what do we still need, what needs to be changed. Hey, before we move on, I want to I go back to, and gosh, we have a call now again. Um, I do want to go back to splitting up California either in two or in four different parts. Let's do it after this call here. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, now that we've had term limits for a number of years, is it really a good idea because somebody like uh, Mr. Manny wouldn't be in the position he was in if we had term limits. Well, what do you feel about uh, term limits now? Thank uh, you. Th that's, that's a great question. Um, and actually, uh, a few years ago, they changed it, um, where they actually lowered the amount of time you could be in the legislature from 14 years to 12 years, but they allowed you to stay in one house for the full period, full 12 years, before it was broken up into six and eight. Now it's 12 six years, let me be clear, six years in the Assembly and eight years in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Now you can then spend 12 years in one house. So what that means is you're not going to have see people jump from the Assembly because they're termed out and run for the Senate. Instead, you'll see people maybe stay in the Assembly, like say a Jim Patterson, for 12 years instead of six years. So that will give them a chance to build relationships, to build expertise, right. and to move in the direction, not all the way to obviously the removal of term limits, but in the direction of what we used to have when Ken Maddy was, was a senator. And one of the things that made him very successful was that he built personal relationships. Uh, we're having a, a fundraiser up in Sacramento in early February, February 11th, with all the big five, um, which also speaks to Ken Maddy, um, the governor, the legislative leaders on the Republican and Democratic side. And it's going to be emceed by Willie Brown. Uh, Willie Brown was a Democrat. He was the, he, he actually likes the term uh, Ayatollah of the Assembly um, when he was, when he was in charge. Clearly partisan. Clearly partisan. And he's told me, he said, Mark, <laughs> the only reason I'd come back to Sacramento was Ken Maddy. Yeah. And he said, if you would put Ken Maddy and me in a room for an hour, we could have solved most of the state's problems. So they got along very, very well. And right. that was but back... two Democrats, though, right? No, M Maddie was a Republican. Maddie was a Republican. He was a Republican right. minority okay. leader. And, okay. uh, and so they negotiated, and they fought like, you know, politicians will fight, but they didn't make it personal. Okay. You know, afterwards, I can give you a very quick story if you'd like. Go ahead. Um, so Willie Brown was, was uh, in the Assembly. He was chair of Ways and Means. And Ways and Means met every Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. Well, Willie also had a card game on Monday nights with his friends, Ken Maddy, Republican, and, and other people. And the card game usually went into, you know, two, three in the morning. Well, it's kind of tough to play cards and be drinking until two and three in the morning and then get up for a nine o'clock uh, hearing at Ways and Means. So Willie had to make some changes. So obviously what he did, he did the obvious thing. He moved Ways and Means to Wednesday. <laughs> he was not going to change the card game. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, that does speak to kind of the relationships and that I think sometimes we have a tendency to personalize politics. And I think it's important to remember that, listen, we're all trying to do the right thing. Republicans, Democrats, independents, we're all aiming at, you know, point B, making the world a better place. But because of our personal experiences, we just have a different way of getting there. But let me ask you something. Let me go back and, uh, you know, it says a lot about Ken Maddy when you have a Willie Brown say, if you, if you put us in a room, we could solve all the state's problems. Mm -hmm. But I want to go back to the, to the problem of California and splitting it in two or in four different parts like that. Uh, six, one, actually, we're talking. Six, yeah. six, six different parts. Okay, uh, you're say, you said earlier that you'd have to change the Constitution of the United States? Right, to allow a state, more states to come in uh, to the Union, you'd have to have the other states agree. And so would there be lawsuits flying all over the place? It would, it, it would never happen because it wouldn't, it, I don't see that the smaller states, either in smaller in population or smaller in geographic size, would allow California to get, instead of uh, two senators, would now what, have 12 senators. Never going to happen. Yeah. It's never going to happen. Yeah. So, so it's, I think what we need to do is, we, we are a very different state, you know, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, the Central Valley. I think what we need to do is, number one, make sure Central Valley has a voice. And that's one of the things that the Maddie Institute tries to do. We want to make sure that we're a voice for the Valley at the table um, and the politicians are aware 
of the needs of this region, and we, I think we need to work in solving those problems. Before we go back to Barbara Boxer, and I do want to talk about her, Maddie Institute was created for what purpose? Did I describe it accurately in the, mono, in the monologue? Well, it, it, close, uh, yes, um, but one thing I think that, that you didn't mention, which I think is very important, is this. Most people don't know this. It was established by a unanimous vote of the California legislature, and I think people just need to stop and think about that for a moment. Can it, could today, could the California legislature agree to anything unanimously? No. You know, that the sun rises no. in the morning or no. you know, it sets in the evening. So that's pretty amazing, and it says it's a testament to Ken Maddy about what, what everyone thought of him. Yeah. Uh, Go back to Barbara Box. Let's put a picture up of uh, the current senator who says she is not running in 2016. What do you think Barbara Boxer has meant to the state of California? Many Republicans said she, you know, she's nothing more than, has been nothing more than uh, a blockade, throwing up roadblocks and trying to solve the water problem for one and many others. What do you think of um, it? Well, actually, I mean, again, it depends on what your political slant is. If you're a Republican, you're not going to like her. If you're a Democrat, you're probably going to like her. Uh, certainly on, and, and really, if you look at the state politically, uh, it's really split between the coast and the valley. Um, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily coastal California is Democratic and inland California is Republican. Um, on the coast, with all her work on the, on the environment, they like her. They like her a lot. Yeah. Uh, inland San California. San Francisco to, all the way to L.A., yeah, right? Yeah, and she started in San Francisco. I think she now lives in Los Angeles. Uh, but, you know, to the folks in those regions, and, you know, politicians do represent the public, um, and then a majority, obviously, because she's been reelected, support her her ideas and her proposals obviously there's another group that's not happy at all with with her proposals but i mean that's politics yeah well she's not going to run and so we talked about uh, kamala harris already we talked about Villa Ragosa. hey the republicans we, we we say they don't have anybody but i i do have some names here and some pictures let's start with charles munger uh, is he a candidate? Is he a is is he a good foe? Is he is he just? Like He's a, a very wealthy individual that, if he wanted to, could bankroll a campaign by himself. But has no and that makes him winning. and that makes him relevant. No, I, I don't. I mean, to be blunt about it, Republicans are going to have an extremely difficult, if not impossible, chance of winning statewide office in California. Even with his money, huh? Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, there's, you can... Uh, uh, He's it? got Huffington-type money. There's yeah, Huffington, uh, Michael Huffington, millionaire, uh, Al Checky, all these people that were, they, <laughs> none of these people were senators, all thought their money could buy them the office. It didn't happen. The problem with the Republicans is that um, the people registered Republican in California has been declining at a precipitous rate for quite some time, and frankly, uh, it really started with uh, Governor Wilson and his, uh, what some people view as anti-immigrant anti stance in the 90s, um, and that's hurt the Republican Party. Is that Prop 187? And, uh, yes, uh, yeah. and, and, so, and so it's gonna be very difficult. In fact, in Los Angeles right now, Republicans are now the third uh, party in essence, Democrats are first, declined to state is second, Republicans are third in terms of registration. So until Republicans change that, um, they're really not going to be uh, competitive statewide. Now, you do have a new state uh, party chairman uh, for the Republican Party, Jim Brulte, very savvy, uh, very smart guy. Um, Tough nose guy. Uh, yeah, and, and knows how to raise money, uh, which is important in politics. He, he's one of the ones that, he is the one that handpicked Ashley Swearingen to run for controller. So he's trying to uh, fill the bench um, for Republicans, and, and, and Ashley Swearingen, the mayor of Fresno, is one person that they're looking at as a rising star. Yeah. Okay. Talking with uh, Mark Kepler from the Maddie Institute here in the city of Fresno, out at Fresno State, 436, Me TV Option 11. A lot more to get to, and I mean a lot more in the next half hour. Back in just a moment. From a top secret location, it's the spies who love me, bringing together Me TV's top super spies to fight evil at a memorable moment's notice. They're daring. That's right. Free. Now what are we going to do? The best we can. Suave. Does that apply to me, Oscar? Possibly. And smart? The old finger in the gun trick. Maxwell Smart. Me TV Fresno. Channel 43.6 and Xfinity 187. Back here on the program on Connect With Me, 436 Me TV Option 11. We do have a phone line open, so a couple of good questions already here um, from uh, you, the viewer, the callers, uh, calling in asking about the split of California and also about the Barbara Boxer uh, situation. She's not running again. More Republicans that might be running. Somebody I've never heard of, Tom De La Baccaro. Let's put his photo He's up. Who, who in the heck is this guy? Former GOP uh, party uh, chairman. 
Okay, I never heard of the guy. Uh, no, I known by by Republicans, but probably nobody else. Duff Sundheim. Please. Same same thing. A Republican Party chair, uh, statewide chair. Again, pro probably virtually no name recognition. Rocky Chavez. Uh, assembly member, uh, again, probably, probably, maybe even not known as his own district. Um, it's amazing how many people don't know who their state legislators are, but um, again, it's a long shot. There's no maybe question. you and I are better, better known. <laughs> well, maybe you. More, yeah, maybe, maybe you are, I think. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, hey, so I, I want to get to the battle between Jerry Brown and Janet Napolitano. Mm -hmm. uh, Janet Napolitano heads the UC system here in the state of California. I want to put their pictures up on the screen and talk about what the battle is going to be about this coming year. Well, first of all, it's interesting. It's a battle of two governors, right? In essence, uh, Napolitano guess, was the yeah. governor of Arizona. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she knows that. how to play politics. <laughs> uh, and the issue there is uh, how much money should the University of California get from the state of California? If you look at the data, uh, the state has been, she is correct, that the state has been de-investing in the University of California for quite some time. Um, right now, uh, the budget proposal is to provide $120 million to the state of California. Uh, that's a fraction of really their operating budget. Um, it is uh, a 4% increase. She uh, wants to raise the rate. She wants to twice as much. She wants 8%. Uh, what well, does Governor increase. Brown want? Um, he wants 120. If, and he's even put another uh, cap on that, he says, you're only going to get 120 if you don't raise tuition. <laughs> if you raise tuition, we'll give you the absolute minimum, which is 100 million. So he's got a $20 million carrot there to say, don't raise tuition. Okay, so these are two Democrats, right? Yeah. They're battling. Oh, yeah. Two Democrats are battling right. well, head she has, to head. She has a, they don't both have different constituencies. Um, her constituency is the University <laughs> of California uh, board of you know board of directors, and his constituency is the state of California. And so, right. uh, and Jerry Brown has. Uh, they say he in, he engages in canoe politics, which Meaning? means he paddles a little to the left. And then he paddles a little to the right. And then he paddles a little to the left. And then he paddles a little to the right. Um, so he, you know, he's he's actually been um, in most people's minds a pretty good steward uh, of the state. And when he came into office, I was talking to the legislative analyst, who was the chief uh, budget nonpartisan budget analyst uh, in Sacramento, <laughs> and he was projecting twenty billion dollar deficits as far as the eye could see. Uh, Jerry Brown has turned that into um, four to six billion dollar uh, surpluses. Now, granted, a good portion of that is his uh, passage of Prop 30, which just so happened to bring in about six billion dollars. But he's also been pretty good about not adding new programs um, to the state uh, uh, agenda and trying just to, to fund those that we already have. Okay, not uh, if you were to, if you were a betting man, would you mm -hmm. put your money on Jerry Brown or Napolitano? That's a great question. Uh, Jerry Brown, because uh, he who has the gold makes the rules. So um, at the end of the day, it's, it's Jerry's play. And he's a tough opponent. And he's, he's very sharp. He's very shrewd. Politically um, astute, right? Should not underestimate him. I mean, but if this is negotiations, right? I mean, yeah. so she's at 8%. If you want to just break it down and make it simple, he's at 4%. She's at 8%. 8 so maybe they'll meet at 6 uh, Who knows? Uh, let me ask you a question before we move on here about Jerry Brown. How did he win election again? I mean, he was the governor back when, in the 70s, as I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, here he runs. He's, what, 72 or 74 years old? He's, I think, How in the heck did the state of Yeah, 76 now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So he's in his 70s. Um, how did he win election again? Not this last time, but the first time around. Um, you're talking about the second time around. The first time around was in the 70s. And then the well, second time around was Well, the first now, time slash second time around. <laughs> right. You're right I, I got you. Because he's saying? been in office so many times. It's hard I know. To, it's hard, hard to, to keep track. <laughs> um, I think people were, um, had frankly had it with an amateur governor. Um, you know, uh, Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger was um, a lot of star quality, a lot of star power, um, very telegenic, um, said a lot of things that uh, were interested people. But, if you but talk, I had no clue as to what he was doing. When you talk to politicians in Sacramento, the bottom line is you got to get something done. And to a lot of folks up there on both sides of the aisle, uh, he came across as kind of being a little bit arrogant, that he knew how to do things, it was going to be his way. and. It's not going to happen when you have. He didn't negotiate that. No, it, it doesn't work when you have 120 legislators who all think they should be governor. Um, it doesn't work that way. I mean, you've got to work compromise. You've got to see what the pressure points are and work out deals. And he was relatively unsuccessful at that. Now, the good thing about Governor Schwarzenegger was uh, is that he really did focus on the valley. Uh, and maybe it was part because of his relationship with uh, Fresno Mayor uh, Alan Autry. Um, and Pete Mijas. And Pete Mijas. And he did, you know, he did focus uh, on the Valley more than a lot of governors have. Um, I will say, you know, Governor Brown has has focused a bit on the Valley. Um, he has been- Not as much. Not as much. 
Um, but he has been incredibly generous uh, with his time with us, for example. I mean, he is going to be headlining this fundraiser we're having in Sacramento. He doesn't have to do that. This is a fundraiser for Valley students. It has no benefit to, you know, to his typical constituency. A lot of our students end up working in Republican legislative offices, but he's doing it. And so I give him some props for that. Um, I think that's really great. And um, So he's a better negotiator than Arnold. Oh, yeah he's, yeah, he's a much more savvy politician. There's no question about it. Yeah, Arnold just came in. He had these cigar meetings, right? Yeah, he had the tent. He had the, the tent in the, in the, in the, on, the, on the Capitol grounds where you yeah. can't smoke in the building. Um, and he, he smoked under the tent. He smoked under the tent. Uh, I mean, like like a lot of politicians, his, his heart was yeah. in the right place. He tried to do probably the right thing in his mind, but in terms of effectiveness, they're running deficits that were pretty staggering uh, by the time he left office. By the way, speaking of Schwarzenegger, him and Condoleezza Rice out as far as replacing yeah. Barbara Boxer. That's true. Yes. They're not going to run. No interest. No. No interest. That's no. surprising. Condoleezza Rice would yeah, be a perfect. Yeah, that's Republicans dream. I mean, yeah, why yeah. not? Why isn't she going to run? Because she probably realizes she'd probably lose. <laughs> <laughs> so, why, you know, she might wait for a Republican administration uh, to get elected and maybe she goes back as Secretary of State or maybe she gets, you know, a Vice President. Right. Uh, as opposed to being unelected in California. All right. 436, Meet TV Option 11. Got to go to break, I guess. Hey, question of the day is what? Let's put that up on the screen before we go to break here on Connect With Me. If you had the power of the pen, if you had a pen in your hand and you could just sign your name and change whatever law you want, what law would you change in the state of California right now as we speak? We'll be back here with our program. Mark Kepler is our guest from the Maddie Institute in just a moment. Frigidaire. We introduce the first home freezer. The first pulsator agitator washer. And now we introduce the Frigidaire Orbit Clean Dishwasher, designed with a unique wash arm that gives you four times more water coverage for a consistently better clean. Frigidaire, over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. Back here with uh, Mark Kepler, and I want to put our question up of, of the day again, see if this uh, generates some phone calls here. If you had the power of the pen right now, my friends, and you could sign anything you want to in law or even reverse something that's existing law, what would you change in California? Would you sign a particular bill into law? Would you reverse a bill that's currently on the books right now? What would you do? Hey, an email question here for Mark Kepler of the Maddie Institute. Uh, the current political figures of note right now that are on the scene, which one of those exemplifies Ken Maddie's ideals? Wow. Um, that, that's a great question. Uh, well, one person I've been very impressed with, uh, frankly, is uh, Senator Anthony Canella. He's a Republican up north um, who is uh, very thoughtful. Whenever you know, I've had him on, on my program, uh, on the Maddie Report, he's always read all the reports by the LAO or the Hoover Commission or the Public Policy Institute of California. He's well-versed. Whether you agree or disagree with uh, yeah. his position, he's thoughtful. Uh, he's, he's, he's thought through the issues. Uh, so I, I would hold uh, Anthony Canella up. Um, as, as a politician in that same kind of uh, He carries mold. the ideals more yeah. than anyone else. Anthony yeah. Canella. All right. Uh, and there's some, good, there's some good Democrats, too. So, I mean, it's on both sides of the aisle, there's some very good people. Juan Arambula was, was very much a, a Ken Maddy type politician. Yeah. Caller, go ahead. You're on the air. Yes, John. Yeah, hi. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you're wondering how uh, Governor Brown got his governorship. He used to be a Jesuit priest at the time. And he was real popular. He actually was in the seminary for a while. He never became a priest, um, okay. but uh, he was in the seminary at an earlier age. Yeah, at an earlier age. Okay, that's true. Have, anyway, that's, you, that's what got him elected. Yeah. Because, do you have a uh, Do you have a question? Well, no. I just uh, no one seemed to know how he got it. So I was hearing on TV, and I said, "Well, I remember." So maybe he had a he higher power elected. helped him get elected. Who knows? <laughs> all right. Thank well, you. I, hope, I hope he does a good job for the people. That's all I care, you know? Right, right. All right. And, uh, Thank you very much for the call. I appreciate it. All right, good comment. Another email question. Uh, the Maddie Institute, of the, all those interns, uh, who would we recognize right now that went on to elective office? Well, um, we've got about 300 or so interns, but the program really started taking off in about 2004, so it's still relatively young. Okay. Um, Will Oliver, um, who is a Madera City Council member, is a Maddie intern. Oh, okay. Um, we have Tal Eslick, who is the Chief of Staff for Congressman Valadeo. 
is Matty Intern. Yep, I know who he is. Uh, Melissa Poole, who's a general counsel with Paramount Farms, is a Matty Intern. Uh, so, you know, we're they're beginning. Out, they're out they're there. there, and <laughs> increasingly, they're they're getting in positions of, of authority and responsibility. And one thing I want to mention is we're in the process right now of uh, having for the fall of 2015 two yeah. uh, $56,000 scholarships. Uh, for Valley students to go on to graduate school. What we want to do is have our top students go on to top schools, Harvard, Yale, whatever, and then yeah. come back to the Valley for two years. And if they do that, we'll make that $56,000 a forgivable loan. They can have it. Yeah. Um, and so the idea is we want to have those folks come back and be city managers and city planners. And if we do two a year, just think about that. Over 10 years, we'd have 20 people in very important positions in the region who've had the very best education and bringing it back to the valley uh, to make the valley a better place. Yeah, I'm so glad the Maddie Institute is here in the city of Fresno. Caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, uh, good morning, morning John. and Mark. You know, on the, uh, well, the question you're asking, uh, I'll give you an answer for me about putting a hold on a bullet train for a little while. Uh, that <laughs> would be um, the answer. Sure. Uh, that you're asking. Yeah, that's the question One. of the day, right? Yes, yes, John. Okay. And then, um, you know, I, because of that, I'd like to see the Amtrak train <laughs> to Martinez to Eureka finished, mm -hmm. if that could ever happen. That's where my daughter is, in, in Arcata, humble state, okay. and that's just a bus that goes from Martinez mm -hmm. to Eureka right now. And from here... To Martinez is the Amtrak train, so that's not completed. You, you, if you want to call it that, okay. and then there's one also in Redding that's not completed. To Redding, I believe, mm -hmm. California. Okay. Uh, they have Amtrak bus, but not the train. Right. Uh, to that. So these are the things. And Mark, I'm going to ask you why? Are we, because uh, is it because of the liberal judges that we have? that's making it so difficult to put a hold on this trade because it seems like every time they're voted on uh it's okayed even even if we were in the the uh red they would okay it it seems uh, is it because of that well i, I hate um, i hate to use i'm getting really what do you go ahead Mark, well, I, 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 I i i hate to um to use a pun but the, that train's left the station um, the, the reality is that the money's already been allocated for uh, Madera to Bakersfield. And what they're going to do also do, this is very interesting. Um, so the money's basically, they have the money to build uh, Madera to Bakersfield. They also are going to have money to build Palmdale to Burbank. So the, the gap is going to be between Palmdale and Bakersfield. Now think about that for a second. Two things that are very important. Number one is they're going to use the cap and trade money, about $250 million, to pay for that uh, uh, Palmdale to Burbank segment. That will start to become a revenue generator. But well, wait uh, till they start tearing up farmland in, in the well, LA well, basin area. Well, yeah, but the real here's the reality. That's going to become a revenue generator. That that will allow hmm. them to then use that to to get a mortgage essentially, additional money to build the rest of the system. Second thing is that they are going to then have a gap between Bakersfield and Palmdale. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got this the uh House Majority Leader uh, Kevin McCarthy from Bakersfield, I mean, obviously extremely influential Republican. I wonder what kind of pressure is going to be put on Kevin McCarthy by folks in his own district that say, my gosh, if we just connect Bakersfield and Palmdale, Bakersfield now becomes a suburb of L.A. and prices are going to go through the roof. So it, it's, going to be, it's a very interesting political pincer play that's going on there. I guess there was a third thing, too. There's actually some talk about then from Palmdale connecting the train to Las Vegas. And folks in Vegas are very interested about doing that. That also becomes... But that's an, an expansion. That would be that, an expansion. And it would be an expansion, but Nevada would pay the majority of that, and it would be another revenue generator for the system. And so, you know, the reality is, yeah, you could argue whether $68 billion, um, which is the current projected cost of high-speed rail... It'll be much more. Well, you could probably... That probably would be In a, the end. a fairly safe bet. But you don't know. It could come under. Well, one of the things that is happening... In the first two segments, the 29-mile segment from Madera to Fresno, and the 60-some mile, 69-mile segment from no, 100, 130-mile segment from uh, Fresno to uh, Bakersfield, um, the the numbers have come in under uh, the projected cost. Both both uh, bids. 
came under what they thought they would cost. Those are the first two stages right. uh, of, this, of this bullet train. Will it ever be built? Will it ever be completed? That was one of our uh, questions of the day, uh, the other day, and we've had, we had Steve Brandau uh, on the program uh, last week talking about this. I, I think the important thing is, frankly, what happened last week. Even though it was symbolic, because they'd already been moving on, on building the high-speed rail system by tearing down uh, buildings. You're talking about the ceremony here in front. Yes. The groundbreaking. The groundbreaking. We have video of that. They, everybody signed the rail. Right. And what was okay. important about that, it's always been important, is to literally get a shovel in the ground. Because once you start a project, it literally creates a momentum of its own. And so if they do build, which they have the money to build, uh, basically, you know, Madeira to Bakersfield, yeah. They're just going to let it stay there? No. It, that's going to be an itch that needs to be scratched. Yeah. And so they're going to eventually connect it to Los Angeles. When they do, I know the caller was talking about going to Eureka on a bus, and I'm sure for her that's extremely Yeah, with the Amtrak, you got to get off, you got to take a bus. Extremely important. Got, yeah, but let me tell you, my mom lives, my 86-year-old mom lives in San Diego. Okay. And so she says, Mark, I'm going to come up and visit you by train. I said, oh, Mom, you don't understand. There's a bus from Union Station <laughs> in L.A. to Bakersfield. You don't want to do that. She goes, no, 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 it would be an adventure. I said, Okay. So she gets off the train in Fresno. She goes, can I please fly home? It was, it was a difficult experience. And that's really the big problem in the system is that gap between Bakersfield and L.A. They close that gap. It becomes a viable system. I want to go to that groundbreaking ceremony that took place last week, that video of Governor Brown signing the rail along with other politicians. But the governor, uh, and I do want to take this phone call. Hang on, caller. Um, the governor said when somebody asked him about the money, you know, uh, well, nobody asked him. He just made the opening statement, opening comments. He goes, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about the money. What do you mean don't worry about the money? That's kind of a, co a comment like that coming from the governor and he said it kind of off the cuff and laughing what do you think of that um, he's very creative at finding funding now <laughs> there are three basic sources of funding um, there's state funding there's federal funding and there's private funding um, states putting up the money I mean through cap and trade a uh, quarter 25% of cap and trade which right now sits at 250 million it's going to go up because cap and trade is, is going to get ex more expensive over time is already being allocated to high-speed rail the, the real key question here is the feds and Right now, if you take, uh, there was a um, Congressional Budget Office, nonpartisan office, said the biggest thing holding back high-speed rail in California is Congress, um, because Congress refuses to allocate any money for that project, and that's the big issue: is the is the the federal uh, Congress, the federal uh, government, the federal government, the, the House and Senate now Republican controlled. They're holding back anti-high-speed rail. They're not going to fund it, so that really becomes the problem. Republicans don't want it. They don't want it, and they control the House and the yes, Senate. They do. Okay, caller, quickly, uh, your question, please. Yes, uh, it, it seems to me that all of the uh, transportation, the, the public transportation here in California, is a uh, burden of the tax uh, uh, people. We're under the burden of paying for all this, and now we're talking about this is going to be used for for a very select few, uh, and this is going to be also operated by our tax dollar. Yep. What about those of us that live in the valley and live in the rural areas that will never take this train? We're not business people. We don't travel from city to city. What about us? Does yeah. anybody care about us? Well, I mean, it, you know, we are in a democracy. Um, and the reality is if the majority of people are going to use it and do find benefit from it, um, chances are it will happen. Who's going to ride it? How well, much will it cost? Well, right now they're projected at $68 billion. What is interesting about... No, the, how, how much will a ticket cost? Uh, and, and who's going to ride it? How many people uh, are going to ride know, this? I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, okay. But those projections, the, the only thing I can tell you is that the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, they don't have a, they don't have a dog in this fight. They looked at the ridership projections and the cost per ticket that was being projected by the High Speed Rail Authority, and they said they those were reasonable projections. And so, I mean, is it like eighty, a hundred bucks a ticket? Uh, so it, it would be it would be comparable, a little less than flying. Okay. Um, so it's going to be comparable, but but they've looked at well, that. Who's going to ride it? Well, again. Th this, these what are, are their projections? These are these are these it? are scientific projections that are beyond you know my capability. What what I can tell you is this: when I look at when I look at topics, I frankly steer away from people who have a have a dog in the fight. So those who are pro you know the high speed rail authority, I like I look at their statistics and, and you know, with a grain of salt. Those that are anti high speed rail, uh, same thing. Grain because, of salt. Be, and who do you look at to be credible? I look at nonpartisan uh, people that don't have a dog in the fight. So something like the Congressional uh, Budget Office the State Legislative Analyst's Office, uh, the Public Policy Institute of California. So folks that, that are trying to make an objective analysis. And you can argue whether or not, if, the, if their projections are correct, you can argue, is that money best spent on high-speed rail? It's very interesting that the governor also noted that the state's infrastructure costs 
the, and, and most of that we're talking about is roads and bridges, is about $59 billion in arrears. It's about the same number. Yeah. And so then the question, really, and that's the question of politics, right, is, is that money better spent on roads or on high-speed rail? Now, there's some people think we need to move to a more of a mass transit system. We can't sustain. You know, right now, gas prices are what? Two bucks a gallon. We're going down. But. Ridiculous. Uh, you, you almost got to do a double take. Uh, but they, a year or so ago, what, they were over $4 a gallon. And so chances are we're going to be revisiting those higher price, uh, prices uh, for gas. Should we have another, alter, another system or not? Uh, again, those are political calculations. Got to take a break. Mark Kepler is here from the Maddie Institute. A lot more to ground to cover. 436 MeTV Option 11. Back in a moment. Spinner's Records 2015 Concert Series at the Waters Auditorium kicks off with Queen Nation and Space Oddity in a salute to Queen and David Bowie Saturday night, January 17th at 7.30. Tickets available at Spinner's Records, Olive and Lucerne, Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to 6. Online at SpinnersRecords.com. Or phone the Warner's Ticket Office at 559-264-2848. Queen Nation and Space Oddity salute Queen and David Bowie Saturday, January 17th at 7.30 at the Warner's Auditorium, Fulton and Tuolumne, a Spinner's Concert presentation. Back here with our finding, uh, final remaining moments, I guess, with uh, Mark Kepler from the uh, Maddie Institute, 436 Me TV Option 11. I know the call coming in. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, this is Dave, and I didn't catch the first of the program, so I don't know the guest name. Mark but, Kepler uh, from the Maddie Institute. Okay. Uh, his statement about, I have three things. His statement about uh, the Congressional Budget Office being neutral. Excuse me, somebody that's in the Congress, and has an opportunity to gain control over 68 to 400 billion because they're not giving you what it's going to cost to finance it and the interest that has to be paid. So I don't think they're neutral at all. Well, you're, you're, I, you're, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I can just tell you that for most people who look at this, they view them as a nonpartisan office. They're there to, you know, advise, just like the Legislative Analyst Office is in Sacramento. They're to advise the legislature. Um, they'll take on the governor. If you read the LAO's report on the current governor's budget, um, they're generally supportive, but they also point out some problems from their opinion um, with the governor's proposal. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you do your best to try to find neutral sources. And one of the, uh, the caller actually brings up an interesting point, and we're all uh, probably somewhat guilty of this, um, is that we kind of have a tendency to, you know, like now with Pandora, you can listen to the music that only you like, right? Yeah. And same with politics now. You can only watch or listen to the things that you like. So if you're conservative, it's going to be Fox News and KMJ. If you're a liberal, it's going to be MSNBC. And what I would suggest to all of, all of your viewers, get outside your comfort zone. If you're a liberal, watch, watch Fox News. If you're a conservative, watch MSNBC. Or if you're a conservative, read um, stuff put out by the Brookings Institution. If you're a, uh, a, a liberal, a liberal um, take a look at the Hoover Institution or the Cato Institute. I mean, see what, in those are thoughtful people. They have, they have certain positions, but at least they're, they're thoughtful. And, and maybe you can you know, modify your positions. It's very few things, in my opinion, very few things in life are black and white. It's a usually lot, a shade of gray. A lot more to cover here. Uh, more than 900 laws, new laws passed uh, this year, 2015. Driver's licenses issued to undocumented workers. Mm -hmm. Let's put that up on the screen now. And uh, what do you think of this law, good or bad? Um, well, I can just tell you the research. Um, the research says there's a DMV study in 2013 um, that found that the vast majority uh, of unlicensed drivers in California are no surprise undocumented immigrants um, and they're three times as likely to cause a fatal crash as licensed drivers and they believe that road safety would be improved if they had if these folks had some basic tr driver training I can give you a personal experience my wife was actually hit uh, by an undocumented um, unlicensed driver and it was interesting when she calls me up and I go to the scene I appear at the same time as the uh, person who was employing that person who wanted to pay me cash to, to not report it. And I said, no, it's going to be it's going to be reported. But I'm sure my story, it's just an anecdote, yeah. but I'm sure my story is common for a lot of folks. And yeah. if we want to have safer roadways, perhaps, perhaps we need to do this. Caller, short on time. Quickly, what's your question, please? Uh, John, my name is Dennis. I'm from Reedy, California. I've been on two bull trains. I've been the one... In, in Japan, from Tokyo to Yokohama, and I've been another another train from Paris to uh, to Deauville, which is in near 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 uh, near uh, England. Okay. And they're beautiful. Uh, you cost around seventy five, eighty dollars. 
Okay. And you go 21, 225, 230 miles an hour and roll. It's beautiful. It's uh, it, I enjoyed it, but it, it it takes a long time to uh, to complete it. But it's 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 a good way of, of of moving transportation people from one point to another point. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much for the call. So it sounds like the United States is behind the eight ball in this. Huh? Yeah, it's interesting. Europe is if you is do travel ahead. if you do traveling overseas, yeah. the U.S. train system. I mean, I'm, I travel, for example, in the Polish system, much mm -hmm. better than the U.S. system. Yeah. I mean, in that part of our transportation system, whether you just think Amtrak should be improved or you believe in high speed rail, we're lacking. All uh, right. Ban on plastic bags that's supposed to take effect in July of this year. However, um, you know, there's a group, uh, uh, you know, on the East Coast. They've, they've actually gathered more than 800,000 signatures to try to put this on the ballot to try to repeal the, the mm -hmm. new law. What do you think? Well, that group is the plastic bag industry. Yeah. Um, and they put $3 million in the campaign to collect those signatures. And it looks like they do have enough to put on the ballot, which right. means that uh, this plastic bag ban is going to be postponed for at least another 16 months. Wow. And it will get on the ballot. More yes, it looks like they it's going to be on the ballot. 400,000 signatures, I Yes, think. and what's interesting is, is the number you need to get on the ballot now has gone down because the number you need is based on how many people voted in the last gubernatorial election. Mm -hmm. Since the turnout in the last election was so low, the, the number of votes you now need to get something on initiative on the ballot is 25% fewer vote, uh, signatures. Why? Because it's based on the number of people that voted in the last gubernatorial election. Got and it. this election, it's such a low voter turnout, so now, so now future, it went down. It went down <laughs> 25%. So it's it's easier to get on the Caller, ballot. Caller, we're extremely short on time. Your question, please. Thank you for calling. Yes, good morning, Mr. Kepler. We've been talking about a lot of challenging issues this morning, uh, one after another. Uh, you know, highly political, charged environment, lack of compromise. <laughs> How are you talking young people into entering this kind of environment? How yeah, you know? that's wow. a good question. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a great question. Um, frankly, I, I, I have to admit, you know, personally, this is not, you know, Mark Kepler Manning, so this is just Mark Kepler Citizen. Maybe as, as I get older, I'm not sure I want young people necessarily. I would like them to work in political offices, but not necessarily run for office. I think yeah. having some experience is kind of important. Um, and I'd like to see someone who's done something for the community with no benefit for themselves, been successful at doing it, then run for office. Be more like, be more like Ken Maddy. Right. All right. A lot more to cover here. Only three minutes to go. Cap and trade, AB 32. This has to do with higher gas prices. We talked about gas going down. What is cap and trade all about? What is AB 32 all about? What does the Air Resources Board have to do with all this? There it is up on the screen. Yeah, ca cap and trade um, is basically about, uh, it comes from AB 32, which was passed in 2006, which basically said, we want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. So that means, I mean, a majority of greenhouse gases come from, you know, gas, petroleum products. 80% I'm sorry, 40 percent, excuse me, 40 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions in California come from tailpipes. So if you're going to address greenhouse gas emissions, you have to address uh, cars, uh, autos, uh, and, and, that, and that portion of the, of the problem. So that's why they now are going to have um, this uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission law apply to transportation But fuel. they say that extra tax, that money is going to go for the bullet train, not really to try to it's reduce the only, emissions. only 25 percent. Okay. Um, so 75 percent. In fact, one of the things that's very interesting about this that's also very important, another 25 percent of the cap and trade money is going to go specifically to communities that are adversely impacted by air quality. Hello, that's the valley. So yeah. the valley could stand to benefit significantly from cap and trade by having money come into the valley from basically taxes the people are paying in Los Angeles and San Francisco. We got one minute left. I wanted to get in the groundwater. We don't have time, but temperance flat, the water bond passed. Mm -hmm. Will temperance flat help us save more water? Um, yeah, I think a, a lot people talk about if this, it's built, people say, you know, conjunctive use, which includes, you know, above ground storage, below ground storage, conservation. So they say, yes, it's part of the puzzle. Here's the problem in the seven point five billion dollar water bond bill that was passed. Um, about 2.7 million go for storage, but the way they define it is it has to be for you know the most efficient uh, public good. Well, what's a public good? Um, if you look at s straight from just saving water, groundwater banking is less expensive than above ground yeah. storage. But if you include recreation, then maybe above ground storage um, has a greater public good. Out of time.
Gosh, you got 10 seconds left. Yes. Will you come back? Be happy to. All right, all right. It goes by fast. It does. I mean, you know, you host the uh, Maddie Report. Can Mark Kepler, our thanks to him today. Thank you very much, sir. Happy New Year to you. Thank he you. is from the Maddie Institute and hosts the Maddie Report on television and radio. And we're going to have him back as a guest. We'll see you back tomorrow on this program with Tate Hill from the Black Chamber of Commerce here in the city of Fresno. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.